thank uh, Itai for the nice introduction and thanks to the organizers for uh, giving me this opportunity to speak about some uh, pretty recent work. So this, uh, this work is actually out as a preprint as well, uh, just if, uh, probably a month ago. Uh, I'm pretty excited about this new, uh, new approach we've been taking. Uh, as you know, we, we have been working on uh, deep learning approaches for modeling uh, regulated genomics data for a few years now uh, with a specific focus on, on model interpretation. And uh, this new class of models, um, we've tried to improve resolution, go really base resolution and sort of uh, uh, dissect the models a little, um, a little more and derive higher order information, uh, specifically focusing on, on motif syntax. And this is joint work with uh, Ziga Avchek and Julia Zeitlinger. So uh, just to get things in perspective, as you know, um, you can perform a variety of different functional genomics experiments to obtain genome-wide maps of transcription factors. And in this case, uh, this is just some ENCODE data. You see uh, various chip-seq tracks for hundreds of different transcription factors. And you can also do uh, chromatin accessibility assays like ATAC-seq and DNA-seq uh, to uh, get genome-wide maps of regulatory elements. Uh, the questions that we're really interested in is how the, the genome itself uh, encodes all of this dynamic uh, regulatory activity, uh, specifically uh, how do transcription factors cooperatively bind DNA and regulate expression in dynamic ways. And so today the talk is really going to focus on uh, trying to understand uh, sort of higher order context uh, or syntax of regulatory DNA. Uh, so just to jump right in, um, one, there are many approaches to analyze this kind of data. Uh, the machine learning approach is typically to take this kind of information and convert it into uh, a, a classic machine learning problem. Uh, so if you think about it, if you have a chip seek or a DNA seek or a tax seek track, uh, you actually have observations across all 3 billion positions in the human genome. If, if this was a, a human experiment. Uh, and so that gives us essentially a sort of a, a expansive training data. Uh, because uh, every position in the genome, or if you bin the genome into little chunks of say, uh, 200 base pairs or something, uh, you can assign each of those chunk, chunks a label based on the, on the data. So if you, for example, perform peak calling or something like that, uh, you would have binary labels saying uh, bound, unbound, or active, inactive, or you could just summarize uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, enrichment of the signal within those bins as a continuous label. And so what you end up with is uh, millions of little DNA sequences, um, each of which are mapped to some binary or continuous label, and this falls very nicely into a classical uh, classification or regression setting. And you can apply all kinds of models to this, uh, uh, ranging from classical motif discovery approaches to uh, supervised machine learning approaches, uh, such as the ones mentioned here. Um, I'm going to focus on uh, the class of models that we like, uh, neural networks. And uh, the primary reason uh, we like it is, is not because of what usually they're touted for, which is their predictive power. Uh, but I personally like them because uh, they can uh, derive features from uh, raw inputs and raw outputs uh, de novo without any prior knowledge. So it gives us a chance to try to understand uh, what might be in the DNA sequence that we may not have found previously because of uh, prior assumptions about how we model DNA. Uh, so just to introduce, I'm sure many of you are, are very well versed in, in convolutional neural networks, but I just want to give you a, a sort of a very basic 101 view of how it works. Um, our goal is to take a, a DNA sequence or a collection of DNA sequences across the genome and map it to, let's say, a binary output, telling us whether this sequence right here is bound or not by this transcription factor. So what we do is we take this DNA sequence and we represent it with a one-hot encoding, which is just a matrix of, uh, of four rows and L columns uh, with a one or a zero corresponding to which nucleotide is present at each position. And our goal is to, again, map the sequence to, uh, to this label. So uh, the basic unit of a neural network is an artificial neuron. Uh, think of it like a simple pattern detector. In this case, this neuron is uh, operating on five nucleotides, as you can see right here, uh, CGATA. It's going to take this input sequence and going to match it to some pattern it has learned. And if that pattern is a good match to the input sequence, it will actually propagate some signal uh, upwards uh, or produce an output. So uh, one of the most basic neurons uh, essentially is, is simply a function that takes in a bunch of inputs and produces an output. Uh, the simplest uh, example here is, as, as I said before, you have five inputs with four channels. So effectively, you have 20 binary inputs. And uh, the simplest kind of neuron you can think of is a simple linear model. So a uh, linear model just combines these inputs using various weights and produces an output. 
In this case, we have uh, 20 inputs, binary inputs. So you would have 20 associated weights and you can visualize them in the same dimensions, uh, four, uh, four channels by, uh, by five positions. And just think that you have some random weights associated with this neuron. Uh, if you visualize this, uh, effectively uh, what it looks like is a position weight matrix. So I think the key take home is that um, an artificial neuron that's operating on a DNA sequence input uh, can essentially encode uh, a, a classic position weight matrix motif uh, using the weights of the network, uh, of, of the neuron. And so in this case, if you take this input sequence and you score it against uh, uh, this, uh, this weight matrix that you just perform this linear operation, uh, you get a nice uh, high scoring value, 11.6, because the input sequence CGATA is a very good match to the weights or the pattern encoded by the weights, which is also a CGATA in this case. So you get a nice positive score telling you it's a good match. Uh, now you don't necessarily need to stop there. You can take this linear output and push it through a nonlinear function. Uh, there are various kinds of nonlinear functions you can use. Um, uh, a popular one is the sigmoid or logistic function. So this converts this, uh, this real valued uh, score into a probability. As you can see right here, it's a very high probability saying that this input sequence is a very good match to the neurons patterns. Uh, the other kind of nonlinearity that's commonly used is a rectified linear unit, which is a simple thresholding function. So all it says is if this linear score Z is less than zero, uh, then we threshold it to zero. If it's greater than zero, we keep it as it is. Okay, so the key thing is that uh, uh, an artificial neuron uh, that's operating on DNA sequence acts like a motif pattern detector. It scores the sequence based on the weights of the neuron and then pushes it through some nonlinearity like a ReLU or a rectified uh, or a sigmoid or logistic to obtain uh, to to uh, to obtain nonlinear outputs. Now, going back to our problem of taking the sequence and mapping it to this uh, label, um, as you know, DNA sequences don't have just one pattern. Uh, there are potentially thousands, thousands of patterns. So instead of having one neuron encoding one motif, uh, we can imagine having thousands of neurons or hundreds of neurons, each of which are trying to learn a different pattern, a different pattern in the sequence. And in this case, uh, you have three banks, uh, uh, you have three neurons right here, each trying to encode a different uh, motif pattern and they're operating on the exact same sequence. So they'll all score the sequence based on the weights that they contain and produce corresponding outputs. Now, typically, if you have a motif, uh, you just take this motif and you scan the sequence looking for matches across the board. And you can perform this exact same operation using these neurons. You can take this bank of neurons and just replicate it across the sequence. Uh, this is referred to as a convolution operation. And each of these neurons will now score every base or every uh, little k-mer in the sequence and produce an output. Um, the outputs of these convolutional neurons can then be passed to higher layers. These higher layers take the outputs of the lower layers and perform the same kind of operations. So what you're doing is effectively learning more and more complex patterns in sort of a hierarchical way. And ultimately the final layer of the neural network uh, just takes these outputs, uh, these pre-ultimate pre outputs and then performs a linear logistic regression. So a neural network is just a fancy lo linear logistic regression model. Uh, it, the only difference is it's inducing all these features de novo from the raw sequence, okay? so. Uh, Obviously these neurons have to be trained just as we train a linear logistic regression model, there is a weights have to be learned. And so just as we train a linear logistic regression model, you provide the neural network uh, millions of training examples of sequence associated with labels and you perform uh, some kind of optimization operation like uh, stochastic gradient descent to optimize some loss function. And that would learn the patterns of the neurons uh, from the data. Okay, so that's, that's basically neural networks 101. So, um, this has been the traditional approach and there have been many interesting papers published in the space. Uh, um, uh, DeepBind, DeepSea, Bassett, just to name a few since uh, 2015. Uh, all of these methods tend to take the genome and as I said before, chunk them into uh, these little chunks and summarize information within 200 base pairs or so. The issue with that is that um, actually if you look at the signals uh, produced by these uh, assays, there's actually pretty rich information in the, in the profile shape itself. So for example, if you look at the ChIP-seq data, uh, you'll notice that uh, at the binding positions, right fl uh, flanking the binding positions, you often get these uh, really gorgeous um, uh, uh, profiles of read counts on the two strands, which are mirror images of each other. And this kind of uh, specific architecture of the reads uh, provides exquisite information about position of the binding site. 
if you instead summarize this information into just total counts in the region or a binary label, you're losing the shape uh, and the subtle uh, information that's contained in the architecture. Uh, similarly, uh, if you look at higher resolution assays such as chip exo or chip nexus, uh, which are similar to chip seek, but they use exonucleases to actually further improve resolution, you can get these very high resolution footprints uh, that can provide you information about the protein DNA contacts itself. And uh, similarly, if you take DNA seq or taxic data, you'll see similar kinds of architectures of the reads. And this information is often lost if you summarize the information uh, before you learn. Um, a similar problem occurs if you take these kinds of assays and look at, for example, uh, uh, active uh, uh, chromatin accessible sites across many cell types of tissues. You'll often have situations where you have these kinds of overlapping peaks. It's often very hard to tell, are these peaks the same? Are they different? Is it the same sequence element driving them and so forth? So we decided to kind of skip the whole procedure of like peak calling and all that stuff, which is, as you all know, very unstable. Different peak callers will give you different results, all that stuff. Let's just use a neural network for what it is. Uh, it's very good at mapping raw inputs to raw outputs. So let's try to just take um, um, some data. In this case, we took chip nexus data from Julia's lab. Uh, specifically for uh, four key transcription factors, OC4, SOX2, and anagrin KLF in mouse embryonic stem cells. And we got this uh, really gorgeous uh, data from her, her lab. As you can see again right here, uh, you got these super high resolution footprints. Um, by the way, just to clarify, this is a, uh, this is an, uh, um, a really high depth example. We sequenced these, uh, these reads, uh, these data sets to about 100 million reads. And this is one of the best uh, peaks in the genome. So, uh, the footprint looks so gorgeous at the single uh, single um, locus resolution, only in rare cases. Usually it's still pretty noisy. So our goal is to kind of learn from this footprinting architecture what we can figure out uh, is in the sequence that's driving these footprints. So we, uh, we developed a new architecture, a new kind of model. Uh, as I said before, we wanted to minimize the amount of processing we were doing on the, on the output data. So we just take the, the chip nexus or chip seek data. You can take any data you like. Um, you map it to the genome, you take the BAMs, and you count how many five prime ends of each read you find on the positive and negative strand. So you just have uh, count profiles, base resolution count profiles on the positive and negative strand. So there's a, there's a, there's a blue positive strand profile and a, and a red negative strand profile. So just raw counts, okay? And our goal is to take the sequence and map it to these counts uh, directly, just, uh, sequence to profile with minimal assumptions. So uh, the main innovations here were not so much the architecture. The architecture is pretty interesting. I mean, it's, it's not that um, unique. It has a bunch of convolutional layers. We added some dilations to account for larger, saving some parameters and accounting for, uh, for longer sequences. And then we added some residual connections because the network is pretty deep. So when you add residual connections, you can learn more effectively in deeper networks. Uh, in my view, I think the, the, the innovation that really helped us was in the loss function. And I think this is uh, something I'll keep harping on again and again, is uh, often the biggest gains you get in deep learning are not through architecture engineering. It is through clever design of the loss functions that obey the, the nature of the noise that you observe in the data. So we're modeling counts, right? Base resolution counts across the sequence. And we, we have some, sort of two types of information. If you think of it like a generative process, you have n number of reads being thrown on this thousand base pair sequence, right? So there's n number of reads falling on that sequence uh, that in some sense captures a total occupancy in that region. So you want to model the total counts in that region. And then we want to take those total counts and understand precisely how those counts are distributed at each position on the two strands. And if you think about it, a multinomial uh, probability function is a very good function that can capture how counts are distributed across positions. So we, we have sort of a joint loss function, one that models a total occupancy which is uh, the total counts. And we tried Poisson negative binomial, but uh, what worked best for us was uh, um, simply a mean squared error on the log of the total counts. So that's capturing total occupancy. And then we have a multinomial loss that captures the profile shape. That is precisely how the reads are probabilistically distributed across the positions um, um, on the profiles. So we go st straight from sequence to profile by, uh, by optimizing these, these loss functions. And we train simultaneously on the four transcription factors, so it's a multitask neural network. Uh, 
Uh, so I'll jump uh, initially into some uh, performance of the model. Uh, so the way we do this is we train the model on a bunch of chromosomes and we predict on a, a bunch of unseen chromosomes. So we're testing generalization in the same cell type on sequences never seen before, okay? And these are all test examples. Uh, these are observed tracks and these are predicted tracks at nucleotide resolution. Uh, these are two uh, canonical enhancers in the genome. Um, as you can see, the observed and predicted tracks uh, are, are remarkably similar, which is quite, quite nice. Uh, you can see it even denoises certain low coverage regions uh, to produce higher resolution footprints. Uh, so that's quite nice. We wanted to obviously evaluate this genome wide. Uh, so what we did is we took all the observed profiles and then we wanted to actually evaluate the positional precision of the model. So how accurately are the predicted footprints aligning with the observed footprints? In order to do that, we take the observed tracks and we set some threshold and the regions, uh, the positions in the, in the profile that are above the threshold are labeled as positive positions, that is footprint locations, and the rest of the positions are labeled as negative. So that now gives us like a positional label on every position in the genome, telling us is it a footprint or not. So now it becomes a binary classification problem. Uh, we're not trying to predict binary labels, we're simply evaluating it as a binary task. Um, and so we can compute the area under the precision recall curve. And we can compare the performance of the model, which is the blue, uh, the blue curve, at various resolutions. So uh, these are different bin sizes, which indicate uh, does the footprint exactly align at the single base pair resolution, or, or do we allow like a switch of two base pairs, or five base pairs, or 10 base pairs, and so forth. And the blue curve is the model. Uh, the orange curve is what you get with replicate experiments. So if you do the same experiment twice, how well does one replicate capture the other? That in some sense gives us like an alpha bound. And then the uh, red curve gives us a lower bound, which is if you just randomize the profiles, how similar would they be to the observed profiles? So you can see in terms of positional accuracy of the footprinting, the model is effectively as accurate as replicates, which is really nice because now we can really take these models and do interesting things with them in, because in some sense we trust, uh, we trust that they are quite accurate. Uh, we can also see how they do on the total counts, that is total occupancy. And the story is a little bit different here. What you see is for total occupancy, the Spearman correlation is good, but it's not exceptional. And this is a very interesting because if we modeled the profiles just as counts and we hadn't separated the, uh, the profiles from the total occupancy, our overall performance would have looked low. Now what we can see clearly is that the, uh, the, the footprint shapes are predicted almost perfectly by this local sequence, but the total occupancy is not. And so we can decouple these two aspects and analyze them separately. And the reason why total occupancy is not predicted as well is we believe partly because of there are other factors involved beyond the local one, one KV sequence, chromatin state, distal interactions and so forth. And one way to test this is, is if we add, for example, DNA seq to the model uh, as an input, uh, we dramatically improve this performance to something close to 0.8 or 0.9. So we get to replicate level accuracy if we simply in in integrate the sequence information with local chromatin state. But for the sake of predicting the profile shape, we do not need anything beyond the local cis sequence. So that's the predictive performance of the model, but none of that matters because we have the data. So there's no point in predicting data you already have. The reason we wanted an accurate model is to believe the model to some extent and then to perform various analyses on it to understand what it's learned. So um, we developed a suite of approaches to interpret these models. The first approach is called deep lift. Uh, this was published in 2017. Uh, and the way this works is you can take any output of the neural network, a particular sequence here is predicting this profile. Um, uh, you don't need the observed profile, you're interpreting the predicted profile. So you can take any DNA sequence, you can predict the profile, and then you can take the profile and backpropagate it through the neurons, uh, effectively getting the contribution of each neuron in each layer all the way back down to the input. And so you get a contribution score for every nucleotide in the input sequence telling you exactly how much it contributes to that output. And we have a nice way of integrating this information across the profile to get a profile-wide important score. So what does this look like? So if we look at the OCT4 enhancer, for example, right here, uh, we're zooming in and you see uh, actually all four transcription factors bind that enhancer. Uh, you see the observed footprints and the predicted footprints for all of them. And uh, the heights of the nucleotides represent the deep lift scores, telling you how much they contribute. And you can see it's, it's quite good at delineating precisely um, 
the motifs for each of these transcription factors, even though many of them are very close by. So if you zoom in a little bit, you'll see the oxox heterodimer right here. You'll see for nanog specifically the nanog motif popping up alongside the oxox, and for KLF4, you'll see this KLF4 motifs are popping up. So de novo from sequence, you can really localize the precise uh, binding sites that are driving these footprints, even if the transcription factors are co-localizing and binding really close to each other. So this way we can interpret any single enhancer in the genome, but we wanted to learn global patterns across the whole data set. So we developed another method called TF Modisco. Think of it like a motif discovery algorithm that uh, takes uh, the, all the hundreds and thousands of binding sites of OCT4, SOX2, NAG, and KLF, and then uses deep lift to interpret uh, which nucleotides in each of the sequences is predictive. We then throw away the pieces of the sequence that are, appear to be not predictive. We obtain these little uh, chunks of sequence, important sequence called sequelets, and then we cluster them using um, a graph-based clustering algorithm uh, into non-redundant motif representations. And so what we obtain is a, a collection. We've taken the, the neural network with its uh, thousands and millions of parameters and condensed it or distilled it into a handful of representative uh, motifs that are derived from the base resolution importance scores. And so what we see is we are looking at four transcription factors in their combinatorial binding sites. Uh, we require a pretty large number of motifs to actually capture all of the patterns learned by the model. So it's not four motifs or four transcription factors which is typically what you'd see if you went to our database. You actually see about 50 motifs, uh, which cap capture subtle differences in how the transcription factors bind. Uh, the nice thing is we have the chip nexus data to provide us the actual footprinting information around those motifs. And what we see is that each of those motifs capture different combinator combinatorics of these footprints and also often different architectures of the footprints itself. So I'll show you, uh, I'll walk through a few examples. Uh, there are too many to go through, but um, some of them are well known. So you have the OxOx uh, heterodimer, you have the OCT4 monomer, you have the OCT OCT homodimer, the SOX2 monomer. Uh, I'll get to this in a second. For Nanog, we find many interesting uh, uh, different binding modes of the transcription factor for KLF4 as well. And then we see tethering events. So we see also uh, footprints for transcription factors through motifs of other, other TFs like ZIC3, and in one case, even the TF3C B box. I'll get, get to this in a second. So just to validate some of these, uh, we took ZIC3 and we performed chip nexus for ZIC3 and we find that all of the instances where we find the ZIC3 motif lighting up, we do see very strong footprints for ZIC3 as well as for the transcription factors that are recruited by the transcription, uh, by, by ZIC3. So it's a nice uh, example of a strong tethering event. Uh, another cool uh, example we had was uh, this TF3B box, which is very intriguing because it didn't initially make a lot of sense, except when we realized later that every time we see this TF3B box motif lighting up, it happens to be at the start and the end of tRNA genes. So it's very specific. You're seeing these B box motifs only light up on the two ends of the tRNA genes, and you see a very distinct OC4 footprint uh, around those sites. So we believe there's a kind of a model where um, TF3C is binding these tRNA genes to regulate or, or transcribe them, and OC4 is somehow being tethered that's regulating the expression of these, TF, of these tRNA genes. So kind of very interesting um, information starting to pop out by just de novo analysis of these motifs. So I just want to get into NANOC because um, it's a very interesting homeobox homeo transcription factor, been studied quite a bit. Uh, but the motifs, we find actually three distinct classes of motifs. One is this a very short PCA motif, the other is what we call the nanog alternate, which is TCA with this GGAAT sequence at the left. And then there's something that's in between, like a fusion of the two with a little other piece popping up here. And uh, one way we could validate this was to look at the crystal structure of nanog binding uh, DNA. And in fact, uh, precisely these important nucleotides tend to be the ones that are closest uh, to the actual protein contact uh, domain. And the three motifs do direct uh, very distinct footprints. So that's another way to kind of at least claim that they might be distinct. Um, the other nice thing we find is uh, much more complex, subtle patterns uh, in, the, in the sequence. So if you take the NAROG motif and you look around it, we actually started noticing these uh, really beautiful plumes of, of 80 rich sequences popping up every about 10 and a half base pairs. So here's an example of all the NAROG sites in the genome. Every row is a NAROG site. And we're simply plotting the important scores of the sequence uh, nucleotides around it. And you'll start seeing, if you just summarize this, 
you see a nice peak precisely at TCA, then you see these 10 and a half base pair periodic patterns. And they happen to correspond quite nicely with uh, what we believe is that Nanog essentially is binding as a homodimer um, to nucleosomal DNA in the major groove. And recent work from uh, actually in vitro assays, um, looking at homeodomain binding to NCAP uh, to nucleosomal DNA through NCAP selex, also in fact finds the exact same pattern, not for Nanog, but for other homeobox factors. Uh, what's interesting is this sort of, sort of periodic uh, pattern that you see around the Nanog motif is not restricted only to the Nanog motif, uh, but to several other motifs, but not all. So this kind of periodic uh, flanking pattern is actually characteristic of many of these uh, ES-associated uh, transcription factors, indicating some interesting interplay between transcription factors and nucleosomes. Um, now, what, what also happens is that TF Modisco, as a motif discovery algorithm, actually can learn uh, motifs of actually any, any length. There's no, no specific constraint on them. And what we realized at one point was uh, a large number of the motifs we were learning were really long. Like many of them were like 70 or 80 base pairs. And uh, they look kind of like this. And they had very, these very distinct footprint patterns. And when we uh, eventually looked into them, we realized that they were all actually transposable elements. So they were all retrotransposons. And uh, we were actually capturing this whole, whole collection of, uh, of uh, TEs that are bound by Oxox and Argon KLF in a combinatorial fashion. What's also nice is um, Modisco provides us two kinds of motifs, classical position frequency matrices, which captures this frequency of nucleotides. And the other is what we call a contribution weight matrix, which is the average uh, of the uh, nucleotide contributions of every base. So the difference between frequency and predictive importance, they capture two different aspects of the motif. So if you look at the, tra uh, tra uh, the transposable elements and you just look at position frequency matrices, uh, because those elements are exactly repeated across the genome, the entire 70 base pairs lights up. It's very hard to figure out within that 70 base pairs what's the precise binding site for each of the transcription factors. But if you look at the contribution weight matrices, which capture the average deep lift scores, the important scores of those nucleotides within those motifs, you can precisely map the binding sites within those transposable elements. And so uh, we see many such instances of TEs with really beautiful combinatorial fixed spacing grammars uh, uh, for these various transcription factors. But if you look outside of transposable elements, we don't actually see much evidence of fixed spacing motif syntax. What we in fact see is something a lot more soft. So what we see is examples like this. So these are uh, basically, if you look, take Nanog, uh, if you take uh, multiple instances of Nanog motifs that light up using the contribution weight matrices, you see that they, uh, they have, again, really beautiful uh, uh, preferred spacings of 10 and a half base pairs. So they're gonna have this helical preferred spacing. You don't really see this with position weight matrices. If you just scan the sequence, you really need the important scores to highlight this information um, and other baseline, uh, other interesting methods like text mix also are unable to capture it to the extent we can. We see similar kind of 10 base pair interactions between SOX2 and Nanog, OCT4 and Nanog, and Nanog and zig 3 So there's really nice preferred uh, soft spacing constraints between these transcription factors. And in fact, you can actually see this in the chip nexus data itself. So just to show you this is not an artifact of the model, if you actually look at the reads themselves of the chip nexus data, uh, whenever you have these motifs next to each other at different distances, you really see this 10 base pair periodic increase in the chip nexus intensity itself. So that's how the model is able to pick it up from the, from the data by capturing these subtle information, subtle patterns in the chip seek reads itself or the chip nexus reads itself. Uh, so um, we're capturing this interesting sort of soft spacing constraints. The question is whether these spacing constraints are actually leading to some kind of cooperative behavior between the transcription factors. So since our models are really accurate, we decided to kind of use them as oracles and use them as an in silico experimental toolbox. So what we can do is effectively use them like MPRAs. So we can uh, construct synthetic sequences, dump motifs in them, and move motifs towards away from each other, change their orientations, and have the model predict what would happen to the footprints around those motifs. Uh, we can also do uh, in silico CRISPR experiments where we take actual sequences in the genome and we do in silico deletions of specific motifs and we see the impact on, on the binding profiles. 
And the reason we can do this is because we believe strongly that the models, as we've shown in the cross-validation framework, uh, the, at least at the level of footprinting, they're as accurate as replicate experiments on new sequences never seen. So we have some trust in the results of these, these uh, simulations. So I'm going to show you a few examples uh, really quickly. Um, this is a, uh, the in silico MPRA-like approach where we construct a synthetic sequence. Uh, we push in an analog motif at this position, and then we add in a SOX, ox -sox, uh, heterodimer motif at this position, and we start moving it towards an analog motif. And the network is predicting uh, the nanog footprint and the OCFO footprint as the motifs are moving towards each other. If you look very closely, you'll see the nanog motif, a uh, nanog footprint bouncing up and down as the OCFOX motif comes towards it, it. And in fact, if you graph this, so if you just plot uh, on the x-axis the distance between the motifs and the y-axis the, uh, the relative increase or decrease in the footprint strength of one TF versus the other based on the spacing, what you see is this really gorgeous 10 and a half base pair response of Nanog to the Oxox motif as it moves towards the Nanog motif. Uh, and this decays uh, exponentially all the way up to 150 base pairs precisely, which is the size of a nucleosome. Also what's really interesting is uh, you can see the Nanog transcription factors footprint responding very heavily to, to the position of the Oxox motif, but the reverse is not true. So the OxOx motif, sorry, OC4 itself doesn't care where an analog motif sits around it. It pretty much sits there like a classic pioneer factor, determines its binding footprint, irrespective of what's around it, but it really regulates uh, cooperatively how nanog actually binds. And you can again see this nice soft, uh, soft spacing of 10 and a half base pairs. Now you might say this is a simulation, who cares? It could be random stuff. Uh, so we can do the in silico CRISPR approach where we take, again, real enhancers in the genome, uh, we take the original sequences, like, like right here, you have OX4 and NANOG binding together. This is the same OX4 enhancer I showed you before. You can see there's an OX OX motif right here and a NANOG motif right here. We can uh, delete the, the uh, OX OX motif and notice that the footprint for OX4 disappears and the footprint for NANOG disappears. So if you delete the OX OX motif, both transcription factors are annihilated. On the other hand, if you delete the nanog motif, only, uh, only nanog is, is dramatically um, uh, reduced, but oxox is unaffected. And if you again graph this across the whole genome, you pick up the exact same pattern. So the simulation experiments are completely agreeing with what we see from the in silico CRISPR, which gives us some confidence that these interactions are in fact likely to be true. Uh, so we can do this for every pair of motifs and transcription factors and pick up really amazing uh, syntax behaviors, which are dependent on, on, uh, on uh, position, on orientation and so forth. And we, we essentially can graph them as this kind of uh, interaction matrix where uh, you, know, you can see classic pioneer behavior. If you delete the OxOx motif, you affect all the transcription factors uh, within protein distance, within 35 base pairs, even, and even up to nucleosome range, so up to 150 base pairs. And Nanog, you can see, is a responder. It responds to everybody except KLF4. And so you see these very nice asymmetric behaviors of pioneer factors driving others and others being responders. Uh, KLF4 seems to be rather independent of all of them. So that's kind of the interesting uh, pairwise relationship between all these factors. Uh, finally, um, well, a lot of this binding information could be simply non-functional. Uh, so one way we try to validate the model is we take the binding, we take the neural network, we uh, freeze all the parameters, we just pull out the last layer of the network and we train a linear regression on MPRA data, the reporter expression data. Uh, so this was from, not from, from us, this was a, a, a nice preprint from Barack Cohen's group. Uh, so it's a completely independent data set. They tested a bunch of enhancers in mouse ES cells uh, look, using MPRAs. And we train on a handful of the MPRA data using the linear regression model and the model predicts uh, uh, the observed and predicted expression levels are extremely accurate, uh, so showing that the binding model can be easily adapted to expression. So um, just to summarize the talk, um, uh, BPNet uh, is an interesting new architecture, I think, that can map raw DNA sequence to nucleotide resolution binding profiles with, uh, with really high accuracy, especially for the profile prediction, it is essentially at replicate level. Uh, the interpretation frameworks like DeepLift, Modisco, and these uh, Oracle synthetic experiments uh, 
allow us to dissect um, nucleotide resolution motif instances, um, construct novel motif representations, discover uh, novel uh, mechanisms of binding, uh, and also pick up uh, interesting information about potential higher order syntax of how uh, motifs and TFs cooperatively influence each other. And finally, these binding models, as you can see, can accurately predict reporter expression as well, indicating that uh, a lot of the binding information we are learning is, is potentially functional in terms of effects on expression. So I like to think of neural networks as gift boxes, uh, not black boxes. <laughs> um, as with all machine learning methods, um, you know, we, we hype all our research. So I'm gonna unhype it a little bit uh, with a bunch of caveats and limitations and things to be very careful about. Uh, neural networks are very powerful, uh, but all neural networks are not the same. Um, there are examples of, of networks you can train which will completely tank on the exact same data. And so when you see people claiming that deep learning is good or bad, um, open the hood, uh, look inside, see what the model actually is doing, and be very careful about uh, problem formulation, loss functions, training strategies, background data, uh, and that's usually far more important than the architecture. People love to talk about the architectures. In my experience, it has never been the architecture. It's always been tricks of how you train the data, how you clean it up, how you design loss functions. And that's usually most of the gain you get. Uh, not all interpretation methods are equal. Uh, there are many methods to interpret neural networks. Uh, they will often give you different results because they often make different assumptions. So you have to be very aware of what the assumptions of the, of the method you're using are. Um, uh, Eva's talk uh, later will hopefully clarify some of the differences between these methods. Um, also remember that interpretation is th through the lens of a specific model. So you have to test robustness to model, uh, model design and data sampling and background sets. And the way we do it often is we train multiple <laughs> models on the same data through bootstrapping and cross-validation. We'll often train different architectures to try to make sure that the results we see are robust across those, those perturbations. And finally, interpretation success depends on model performance. Uh, so if your model is not very accurate, you should definitely not believe your predictions much. Uh, but you can also get very accurate predictions and get completely garbage interpretation. And a famous example, I don't have results here, but um, we have some really cool results where essentially in many cases, the neural network can learn uh, very accurate models by simply leveraging uh, subtle things like GC content and so forth. And so if you actually visualize those kinds of models and interpret them, uh, you will get completely wonky interpretations that have nothing to do with biology. Uh, so all of these things have to be kept in mind. Um, we try to be as careful as possible, uh, but you know this is true for any model, so we just have to go with the flow. Um, finally, uh, if you're interested in, in using these kinds of models, uh, the BPNet model is also in this uh, model zoo. This is the first model zoo for genomics that we published recently in Nature Biotech. Uh, it has over 2,000 models uh, from all over the literature. Uh, within five lines of code, you can replicate results that would otherwise have taken you three months to do. Um, and last but not least, if you're new to neural networks and you want to learn how to train dragons, um, you can go to our website and this has free uh, Google Colab notebooks that you can walk through. We have five or six interesting exercises from simulations to real data and it, sh it should get you started quite well. Um, so. Again, I'm taking credit for work I have not done at all. Uh, this is really all done by Ziga, Avanti, Melanie, Amar, and uh, really thanks to Julia, who's taught me a lot of uh, biology over the last two years. Um, and her lab who did a lot of the experiments and our funding sources. Thanks. Yes. I have a question. Some of you depend on the quality of the data. Because you have to cite really high quality to Excel data. Yeah. What happens if you have poor resolution, cryptic data, and maybe coming from the lab that's out of focus as well? Thank you. Um, <laughs> I, I, I was hoping you would ask that question. So uh, in the supplement of the paper, we actually applied this to ChipSeq as well. And more recently, we've actually applied it to hundreds and thousands of ChipSeq data sets. And believe it or not, like um, even though ChipSeq isn't high resolution, as high as ChipNexus, the, the, you can pick up 
um, you can replicate almost all of this information that we picked up from the chip nexus data through ChIP-seq experiments for the same four transcription factors. Um, and so uh, the main advantage you get of the chip nexus is you, you have higher resolution in the data itself. So a lot of your motif instances and others you call tend to be more accurate, but you can pick up a large part of the global uh, uh, features and the interactions we pick up, which is aggregated across many thousand genomic locations, even using ChIP-seq. So it can absolutely be applied to, uh, we've now applied it to ChIP-seq. Uh, there's a poster from a high school student from my lab on cut and run, he's applied the same kind of models to cut and run data. You can apply it to DNA seq, attack seq, and uh, the models also account for uh, assay biases. So we can take care of that too. Anyway, so Hi, uh, thanks. Thanks, thanks. So thanks for the last three or four slides that you're having after. Yeah. A couple of questions. So it was very nice to see the transposable elements part of it. Yes. And, uh, you said that you found six spacing there, presumably because it it found uh, copies of the elements that were relatively uh, uh, recently derived from each other. Exactly. So you could probably then trace, uh, you could use that as a starting point to trace older versions of it and then actually yes. see the space contained and the effect on the binding. Right? That's right. So, Step. Yes, uh, uh, we we did a large part of it uh, for this work itself, but it kind of evolved into its own thing. So we're kind of working on a follow-up paper specifically on transposable elements and what we can pick out of that. Yeah. Great. And the other question is about uh, the model has been has learned not only the cis code but also the trans. Uh, um, the, the TF concentrations and so on, and uh, even other TF not present in your in your set, yes. uh, have been included in this part of the CIS code. Right, yes. So have you tried applying it to uh, any kind of chip data from, let's say, later stages of during, uh, after dif during differentiation to see if any of the um, subtle patterns change um, as the trans context changes? Yeah, we are hoping to do that. We don't currently have chip nexus data in that kind of context, but uh, we've applied very similar methods to uh, uh, attack seek time courses. And we've uh, we picked up really interesting things which we validated using MPRAs. And so there's evidence that the models are really learning interesting dynamic uh, regulation as well. Uh, we haven't seen examples of uh, the same TF kind of binding with different modes okay. across time. Uh, but that's probably because uh, we've been looking at a taxi, which is a little more confounded with a lot of other stuff. So, uh, Yeah, so I actually didn't mention, so all this interpretation is done on the profile loss, but we have this whole occupancy loss. And actually if you interpret that piece, you get all other kinds of interesting information. So you get motifs that actually stabilize binding. That's the way we interpret it because they contribute to total occupancy, but they have no footprints. So if you look above those motifs that you often see homotopic combinations in the sequence. If you look above those motifs, there's no footprints. So it's not like a direct binding event, but clearly like if you look at the total occupancy part of the model, uh, those motifs are contributing to that. So the, there is interesting information about like how motifs are driving direct contact versus stabilizing binding. You can kind of start picking that up too if you separate these losses as total occupancy. And if you add accessibility information, you get other kinds of information as well. So it's kind of interesting. Yeah. Thanks for the talk. Um, I found it uh, fascinating that you chose to use uh, this architecture of yeah, so I think the key thing to realize is that regulatory DNA sequence doesn't necessarily behave like classical definition of a sequence in the sense that it has a lot of positional invariance into it. Uh, there aren't very many hard grammars. Um, like hard spacing, orientation grammar. So for example, if you're doing this on coding sequence, you would have definitely used LSTMs or RNNs because there's so much you know, structure in there and the specific uh, 
you know, constraints of spacing and which words come before and after. When regulatory DNA, most of it is not doing much. And then you have these words embedded in them. They kind of kind of move around. It fits very nicely in the classical notion of a convolutional network, like kind of like where you have some, you know, local pattern that kind of can move around and there are, there are weak constraints uh, uh, capturing them. So it actually fits quite well. We've applied other models. We've seen no gains at all. So CNNs are kind of nice. They train very fast, easy to interpret. So overall, you kind of, yeah, it's, it's the best bang for the buck. Okay. And you mentioned already the first layer. Um, kind of by no, uh, that is just a cartoon. Uh, okay. The architecture is specific, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, it was really interesting that the model can Yeah. So there are two aspects actually that contribute. One is that it has seen similar motifs elsewhere. Uh, but what actually it really homes in on is the structure of the reeds. That really helps it home in because if you just looked at, at a peak and the repeat was inside the peak and you just said peak, no peak, it cannot localize the signal. But if you look at the read patterns, then it gets to see, oh yeah, it's this piece versus that piece. So actually what we see is the motif instances in the repeats are actually not exactly like what you see outside. They tend to be lower affinity. You tend to see many more of them. So it's, it's kind of an ancestral version of the motifs and the network still picks it up. And that's why we actually have 50 different motifs uh, because you have all these slightly different affinity versions of all of those. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thanks